We now will move to the uh, second item on uh, the agenda today, Emerson versus Hillsborough County. May it please the court, my name is Chris Altenburn. I'm a member of Banker Lopez Gasler, and I'm here today representing Stacy White in this consolidated appeal. The parties have provided you with extensive written argument, but in this short time, the simplest 90 second explanation of both issues, the supremacy issue and the severance issue, is that the overall purpose explained to the voters in the text of the first section of Article 11 flew in the face of the text of the legislature's language in Section 212.0551D. The legislature had created a broad list of optional uses for, and, and had specified that the selection of those uses in whatever order they wished would be made as the county commission deemed appropriate. But all for transportation had its own agenda as to what it would want the proceeds to be used for. So in the text of the first section of Article 11, Article 11 informed the voters that the overall purpose was to fund a detailed list of transportation projects. Now this was implemented then by substantive provisions that, that created a a mandatory distribution process, conditions and restrictions upon the projects that could be done, and this was further then enforced by the coercive powers given, given to the Independent Oversight Committee. We had a standard judicial review of this by the circuit court, and the circuit court found that 14 sections of the substance part of this plan violated the Constitution due to supremacy. But the trial court didn't appreciate that the core problem was that th the overall purpose that had been announced to these voters was constitutionally inappropriate in itself. And thus, once he removed the substantive provisions, there was nothing left in the text of Article 11 that gave any purpose for this remaining tax and the unconstitutional purpose, which was to fund the projects that were listed to the voters and described by all for transportation, no longer supported a tax that was really just a means to that improper end. And as a result of that, the trial court's decision on the supremacy clause should be affirmed and its decision on, this, on severability should be reversed. Council, could you address uh, uh, the interaction between your argument and the argument that the House of Representatives made that basically this whole thing was sort of stillborn because it presented a question to the voters that the legislature essentially didn't allow to be presented. In other words, the argument that really the only thing that the voters can be presented with is the question of whether to levy the tax at all and that by packaging it in this big plan that, that sort of nullified the whole thing out of the gate. And, and, and I'm, and I'm I would strongly advocate for that, and I will tell you that the, the, the problem here is that the, when the county commission is not involved in creating the ordinance or the charter, in which it maybe could put in some substantive provisions, and when this comes from the citizens' initiative, the only thing they can tell the voters under the statute, in my opinion, is that you should create a 1% tax, and that that tax will be used for a statutory 
um, uses authorized and as deemed appropriate by the county commission. It doesn't need to go on for pages and pages and pages because in that situation, the voters need to know that after it's enacted, later the county commission will select the uses. And that so did not the, happen here. So would the supremacy problem not be present if the county commission itself had proposed this to the voters and said we're locking ourselves in and we're deeming this plan appropriate? I think it gets more complicated then. So for example, if the, if the current commission said we want to use a, a chunk of this for bonds, right up front we're going to buy bonds and they're going to last for 30 years, I think I'd have to say, yeah, they could put that into an ordinance or a, or a charter amendment. But I do not believe that the current commission could put things into any of this that would bind uh, the commission 20 years later on annual appropriations. I think that would be inappropriate, even if this was coming from, from the county commission. How, how do we deal with the fact that the arguments made in the amicus brief, they raise some very interesting arguments that are not raised in your brief. Well, if they're not raised by the parties, you can't consider them. I will say that I think that the associated industry has, has, has nicely complemented my, my final argument. You think that's the, the same argument? The suggestion that cramps should be replaced by something else. Yes, I, I think that that is part of, of my argument that, that there ought to be a different test when it's a local initiative uh, that's, that doesn't go through the standard process. So I do think you can consider that, but, but it, I had raised the constitutional, well, the ballot summary issues as on the assumption that if it was all constitutional, then the ballot was still ineffective. But having d had the court separate out all of this, the plan from this, there was really no reason for me to come in and talk about whether the ballot was correct for everything. The problem now is that the ballot and Article 11 didn't adequately explain a purpose to these voters about what they were really getting. So that is why it, it, it cannot survive the severance test under Cramp or under any of the, well, really under your decision in Demings and, and even this recent discussion in, in Gaylor. So um, now. And, and, and of course, Cramp, the severability tests that we use are judicially created, correct? They're judicially created. And it goes back to 1962, before standards review were even thought about by courts. And frankly, I think some of the language that concerned me, because it felt like it was evidentiary, and I didn't know how much evidence I needed to bring to this table. Um, it would be nice to know that this is a pure legal text test, that we do it by the text, and that we would maybe only look at contextual materials if there was some conflict within the text. In this particular case, I think that the material that I gave you on advertising, for example, is just simply consistent with my reading of the text, both of, of, of Article 11 and of the ballot summary. Would you, would you agree that an overarching principle is that the, the court should give great deference to the will of the lawmaker? Yes, and, and but, so this, but, but, but I'll let it's you different with the legislature because of the process that goes through. And, and what happened here was, you know, if, if, the, if the lawmaker is the voters, well, the voters were given something that right up front tells them that the purpose is to do something that a second year law student should have been able to tell them was unconstitutional, that they couldn't pre-select the, the, the projects for them. So while I think we should give great deference to the voters, I frankly don't think we do that if we allow citizens' initiatives to come forth with, with things that are unconstitutional at the time that they're delivered to the supervisor of elections office to, to begin this process. And if the problem is, is that there's basically a fundamental procedural defect in terms of the approval itself, then you wouldn't need to get to the severability analysis because essentially the voters would not have enacted anything. That's correct. Yes. If you set aside that argument that's fleshed out in the, in the House's brief, and, and understanding that the severability doctrine is trying to determine when we can't allow the will of the lawmaker to stand because what's left is probably wouldn't have been passed or um, if not. Would it make sense to also consider 
the subsequent action of the commission, if, if through the bond validation proceeding, they sort of gave the voters what they, what they wanted. I mean, I know it's not part of the cramp test, but it seems like that, not in determining whether those provisions are valid at all, but, but in determining whether the rest should stand, shouldn't those actions be taken into account, setting aside the House's argument? Well, and, and this sort of goes to the Eastern Airlines case that had that severance would, if it, if it would cause results unanticipated by the legislature, then there could be no severance. And, and they've switched that around and said, well, because we changed this thing, now it's, it, it's the same anticipation as what the voters voted for. And my responses to that are, first of all, if you're going to be textualist about this, the, the issue really for both, is certainly for supremacy, but also I believe for severability is what was the status of the law between the Constitution of Florida and the Constitution of this county on the day of the election and that you can't go, f go fixing that after the fact by some inferior document by a group that the two years later with new incoming commissioners it, it may all change. So I just don't think that, that if you stay true to textualism you can do this. But even then, have, what arises, and it's fairly obvious in this case, is that everyone knows that if they don't deem appropriate everything that they have maintained was constitutional, that, that severability will, will not work and that they will lose this tax. So you have some, a private group that comes forth with, this is what we really want to do, and we put the county commission in a posture where if they want to keep any tax at all, they have to do that which was unconstitutional from the beginning, and I just think that's bad policy. Right, you, you are uh, into your reserve time quite a bit. Oh, I'm sorry. But, well, but I'm going <laughs> to. The I'm lights gonna, are on the wrong side. Because we helped, we helped, uh, we helped you consume it. Uh, I will still give you your, your uh, the Two time minutes. that you had reserved. Thank you very much. Four minutes, so. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, my name is Derek Ho, and I represent Bob Emerson, who is a citizen and taxpayer of Hillsborough County who intervened in the bond validation proceeding to challenge the constitutionality of the Hillsborough County uh, Transportation Surtax. Our principal submission is that multiple provisions of Article 11 make clear that the mandatory but unconstitutional spending plan was integral to the surtax and that severance would be improper because it would consummate a bait and switch on the voters of Hillsborough County. If I could ad address Justice Lawson's questions about the will of the people as well as the issue of the uh, commission's post-enactment uh, uh, conduct. We would agree that the principal objective of severance is to make sure that the will of the people is in fact enacted, but that does not mean that you save as much of the referendum as possible when it is clear from the text of the referendum itself that the voters thought that the mandatory spending plan and the surtax were essentially joined at the hip. And in addition to section 11.1, uh, which Mr. Altenburn has re referred to, there are multiple other provisions of Article 11 that make that clear. I think one that hasn't gotten as much play in the briefs is actually Article 11.2, which is the levy itself. The levy provision has as its third sentence a very emphatic statement that notwithstanding anything in the charter to the contrary, the proceeds of the tax must be used in conformance with the mandatory spending provisions of Article 11. So the levy doesn't even stand apart from the mandatory spending plan. Not a single provision of Article 1 has a freestanding levy. And that tells you that the two are really textually and in terms of the purposes of the voters uh, joined together. Another, I think, provision that's important, I think, is the first sentence of Article 11.10, which says that the IOC's oversight is critical to ensure the successful implementation of the surtax. So there again, textually, you can see that the rev referendum states that the mandatory spending plan is critical to the overall surtax's objectives. So the basic problem, of course, is that the voters in the referendum tried to keep for themselves 
power that the legislature said that the commission should have uh, pursuant to its discretion under 212.0551D. And the fact that the commission comes in and says after the fact, well, we will essentially go along with what the voters wanted doesn't solve that problem because the, the, the issue is that the voters did not want the commission to have any choice but to adopt what they had uh, directed. And the legislature said that the voters are not allowed to do that. So it may be the case that the commission for now has essentially acceded to the will of the voters, but that still runs contrary to the text and purposes of 212.0551D, which says that the commission should have the discretion, irrespective of the direction of the voters, to decide how these uh, uh, monies ought to be spent. And I apologize for interrupting you, but so that sort of brings me back to my question. I'm trying to separate sort of the procedural way that this was put in front of the voters versus the substance of what's in the charter amendment. So what's your position on whether there would still be a supremacy problem if the county commission itself had said, this is what we deem appropriate. We want to lock ourselves in and we're putting this charter amendment proposal in front of the voters. Would that, would you still have the same substantive problem? I think I, I share Mr. Altenburn's uh, view that you know there may be some issues on which the county commission can bind itself over the course of a 30-year tax, um, but you know in terms of uh, annual appropriations or, or specific projects, it may still be problematic. But of course, that's not at all what happened here. The commission essentially said, well, the voters have directed us how to use the money, and so in order to try to save this thing. Um, we're going to accede uh, to the voters' will, and that still runs contrary to 212.0551D. Um, I, I, I appreciate that Your Honor's question raises a somewhat trickier issue, and if that really were the case, um, you know, it may be a more difficult issue under the Supremacy Clause, but it's not the, it's not the case that we have here. And where do we, and as far as our ability, um, in terms of the posture of the case and the arguments that have been preserved, I mean, if we agree with the House's perspective on, on the substance, is that an option that you, an avenue that you think is still available to us? I, I do think it is. It, it, it is, um, it, the House's argument is rooted in the text of 212.0551D. Uh, and I, I think it's fair to say that the party's briefs focus more heavily on uh, the deems appropriate language of that provision, but it is essentially the flip side of the coin, I think, to observe, as the House does, that the only thing that's authorized under .0551 in terms of what the voters are allowed to do is to levy the tax. So on the one hand, the voters are allocated the authority to levy the tax, and on the other hand, the Commission is given the authority to deem appropriate the expenditures, I think those are really the flip, flip si two sides of the same argumentative coin. If there are no further questions, uh, we urge the court to reverse. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, George Lemieux from the Gunster Law Firm. I have the privilege of representing Hillsborough County in the city of Tampa in this matter. Appellants argue upon a fact which is not in evidence, a hypothetical dispute between the people of Hillsborough County and their county commission. The people of Hillsborough County in November of 2018 voted for critically needed transportation improvements in their county, and the county commission, not once, but twice, deemed appropriate those uses. The way that this statute works is that the state legislature gave power to both the people and to the county commission. The people could put a charter amendment on the ballot as they did, or the county commission could put on the ballot a referendum to support this. The legislature did not just say the county commission can do this by themselves. The people were important to this. Now, in terms of the question that you asked, Justice Munoz, about whether or not the House's uh, argument about this being stillborn from the beginning, what 212.0551C says is that a proposal will be put on the ballot. What is a proposal? The definition of a proposal by Black's Law Dictionary is an offer by one person to another of terms and conditions with reference to some work or undertaking. It is beyond belief that the legislature would just say to the people, 
Go to the commission and say, levy a tax, here's a bag of money, do with it what you will well, the, under the but statute. The, but the statute, I'm, I'm looking at the statute, it's, it refers C1, refers to the proposal to adopt a discretionary sales surtax as provided in this subsection and to create a trust fund. That's what it says. That's a specific proposal. It's focused on the, the creation of a sales surtax and uh, the creation of a trust fund. Uh, and then later, uh, the statute makes clear uh, that the proceeds from the surtax shall be applied to as many or as few of the uses enumerated below in whatever combination the county commission deems appropriate. And doesn't that seem to be just entirely different than what was presented here, which was this uh, elaborate scheme uh, to control the disposition of the funds that would come from the surtax. Your Honor, what the proposal was, and that word has meaning as I just referenced, and it states proposal means terms and conditions, was suggested uses for the surtax. There is no dispute between the parties. It wasn't suggested. There's, was alloca it? there's allocations that fall within the four subparagraphs of subsection D. Subsection D gives a variety of choices for how the money would be used, including giving the money to a transit authority, uh, giving the money to cities to spend on different types of uses from roads to bridges to transit. Well, is there anywhere in uh, uh, Article 11 uh, that says these, are, these uses are suggested? It says that these are the uses that will be put forward to the people, becomes part of the charter. And those uses are consistent with what's in the statute, and there's no dispute about that. That was stipulated to below. The question is, did this abridge the county's authority? Did it abridge their deems appropriate authority? Well, before you, the county has deemed it appropriate. Well, let me ask you this. If, if the county had not um, enacted the ordinance and done this thing with the bonds uh, that happened subsequently, so the county commission had said, well, no, we don't think so. Where would we be? If the county commission deemed appropriate other uses, yes. then they have the authority to do that under the statute. If that was in conflict with... Well, what, but that, how, the voters didn't know that. That's not what the, that's not what the proposal said, is what, it? What the voters knew, Your Honor, from the ballot summary is that a transportation tax for the Hillsborough County and the cities and unincorporated areas would be for roads and bridges, expanding public transit options, other types of transportation that would be for 30 years, and that there would be oversight. Well, so you're assuming, so what you, uh, if I understand correctly, you're assuming that the voters only knew what was in the summary, and that therefore we can't look at what was in the, the actual proposal. You Is can that, look what's in the actual proposal, but the summary was what was in front well, of the but, voters. But, but they what's voted. in the actual proposal, any, anybody who looked at the actual proposal, and I've got to believe some of the voters would have done that at least, uh, would have gotten a very different picture. They would have thought that, wait, this is set. We know where this money is going to be going for the, th for the 30 years um, in a, in a, this, under the scheme that is set out, that kind of the county commission's over here, but we've got this scheme that really is going to do something that overrides what the uh, authority of the county commission is. It, it wouldn't, wouldn't somebody reading the proposal actually have understood that? Your Honor, respectfully, if you read, when reading the proposal, the voter would also see that in several provisions it says, I think 11 times, that if there's any part of this charter amendment that's inconsistent with the statute, that the statute rules, well, there's but, a severability yeah, the, portion. The problem with that, I mean, that, putting that in there, saying that the, the, uh, that the state law is supreme, well, that's like, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a statement of the obvious. Um, but it seems like to me, at, at the very best, this is if what's involved in this is a is a deceptive double talk. Um, and wh why am I wrong about that? Why wouldn't uh, uh, somebody? Uh, you can't. So basically, you're say, if, if I understand what you're saying is, well, all that stuff is just talk. Uh, that's that really doesn't mean anything because we've got to to ultimately follow what the, the statute here says. But why wouldn't that just be? Uh, kind of a very uh, untoward way of presenting this to the voters. It's not untoward at all, Your Honor. The voters have the right, and they did, to give in instructions to their government. 
the government has the right to deem them appropriate or not. In this case, they chose to deem them appropriate. But I'm not actually sure if that premise is right in the sense that it seems so obviously this is an area where the only authority that the county has is what's delegated by the legislature. And so it seems like the basic statutory scheme here is that the county commission is in the driver's seat as to the permissible uses, the appropriate uses, and that what the voters' role is is to whether to approve the tax or not. And it seems like by pursuing this through an initiative and having such a prescriptive plan and having the oversight board with the veto authority and everything, that essentially the people bypassed the structure that the legislature set out here. I mean, that's the problem that I'm having with it. Why have the people be able to offer a charter amendment at all then? Why just not let the county commission put it up for a referendum? The people have well, the right the to suggest a proposal. Well, that's what but, the statute says, Your Honor. But this is a framework. We didn't create the framework. The, the legislature created this framework. And I, I, I think what we're struggling with is trying to see how you can fit this in with that framework, with what was actually proposed into this framework, and then we get, well, never mind, it really, uh, what was proposed really isn't binding uh, because the state law uh, uh, controls. Uh, and we've got this, you know, it's pursuant to Article 11 and pursuant to the statute. Uh, and consistent with the statute. It just seems like to me that that's like a, there's something uh, that is amiss here when the voters are presented with something like that. Um, and if the, then the county commission says, no, we don't want to do it, the, uh, the, the, um, uh, we're not going to do that, then, then it's your position we would get the money anyway and that the county commission can do with it as they please. Yeah, well, and let me actually, let me, because your time's running short, but let me just make, I want to make sure we understand your position. Is it your position that because of the many references to um, Chapter 212 in, in the Charter Amendment, that essentially all of the prescriptive stuff about how to use the money, essentially that that's all a nullity and that once the voters approve the tax that it, we revert to the statutory scheme of the county commission being able to do whatever it wants? Well, my first position is that there is no conflict because the county commission deemed it appropriate. I, so this is just that, a facial put, challenge. But let's put that but aside. In, in a circumstance the where the county the commission said no, we're not going to deem it appropriate. And by the way, one commissioner voted no, so they could have voted no. Then you'd be in a circumstance with whether or not the county commission was following their own charter and whether there was a violation between what they deemed Which, appropriate and what was in the resolution. Which textually though, the way you're reading the charter is the charter essentially says, do X, Y, and Z, except to the extent that it conflicts with state law. And so since state law preempts everything and state law gives the county commission unfettered discretion within the category set out in the statute, isn't your position basically that everything prescriptive in there goes away and all you're left with is whatever the county commission deems appropriate? No, I think that's a bridge too far. I think that the county commission has to still, the statute is supreme and they're going to look at those categories. They're going to make their best decisions. It's hard to understand what hypothetical this would be. Are they taking one part and deeming it appropriate? Are they taking another part? We could imagine that a citizen well, of Hillsborough your position County is that could they file can, a lawsuit. If your position is that they can take one part and not another part, then why couldn't they ignore the whole thing? I think it's Justice Muniz's point. Well, th they, can de they have the authority to deem appropriate. It's been put in the charter, the instructions that were given to them, the terms and conditions by the people. They would have to wrestle that out as the commissioners elected with a 57% vote that said, this is how we want to use the money. But, and as I see my time is running out, the important thing is that's not really before you because the Hillsborough County Commission twice deemed this appropriate. This is not one of the type of cases you have where the commission has sued prior to the enactment of the resolution or the charter amendment saying this goes too far. The commission has agreed and they have deemed it appropriate. You have consumed all your extra time just like uh, uh, Mr. Altenburn did, but I will let you have your two minutes. That Thank you. you. Reserve, so. May it please the court, Raul Cantero for All for Transportation. The theme running through this court's cases is that is a reluctance to overturn the will of the voters in a home rule charted county unless absolutely necessary and then only to the extent necessary. This is evident in cases like 
Kelly versus Broward County, in which the court says we're not going to imply any, uh, any conflict. It has to be an express conflict with the statute or the Constitution. And in Diagostino, this court interpreted an ordinance that provided for a citizen's investigative panel um, to subpoena uh, people to come in and testify. And the court said that part of that violated the, um, the police officer's Bill of Rights. In that case, the ordinance specifically said it's, that it's going to comply with the police officer's Bill of Rights. And so the court said, well, the ordinance says to comply with the Bill of Rights. You can't comply with the Bill of Rights and subpoena police officers. So we're going to read that out of the ordinance and affirm as constitutional the rest of the ordinance. Would you please address the specific severability clause in 11.11.2? Yes, Your Honor. That is limited to 11.07 and 11.08. And, 11, and it says it impermissible. It doesn't talk about severability. It doesn't say uh, talk about uh, severability the way severability clauses do. And that's because there's a charter provision um, I think it's 9.05 in the charter, it's not in the amendment, it's in the uh, county charter that says it's a full-blown severability provision that if any provision of this charter is deemed unconstitutional or invalid, that the rest will apply. Right, that more general provision does not exist here, right? It does exist because this is an amendment to the county charter and it's part of the county charter. They're arguing that, well, if it's in one statute that, and there's another statute that's uh, more specific, the more specific applies. But that's not what we have here. We have a charter amendment, so it becomes part of the charter. It's as if you had a constitutional amendment, it becomes part of the Constitution. What about the uh, argument they have that this is a very integral part of uh, what they're trying to do? The fact that all these different uh, agencies, as they're described in the agreement, how they're to spend the money, um, the notion that if in any part is deemed to be uh, an improper expenditure, then some other type of admissible expenditure is. All of this is very integral and interwoven, so the severability analysis uh, should tell us that we should not sever this, that you cannot sever it. Your Honor, uh, Mr. White himself, at page 40 of his brief, conceded that, and I'm quoting, from the ballot summary, the legislative intent and purpose are essentially the same expressed as in 1101. There's nothing in the ballot summary that talks about how you distribute these funds and the percentages. All the ballot summary talks about is what's in 1101 through 1104, which was left intact by a trial court, which says we're going to have a a transportation surtax for 1% and it's going to be for 30 years and it's going to go to transportation uses. Is there any authority that suggests that um, we should limit our view to the summary? No, when and I'm not saying you should. Right. Okay. I'm not saying I mean, you should. The, the, what, what the, if it's the will of the lawmaker, the people here, they, they enacted the entire, the entire ordinance. Yes, and, but and the, the question is that... I think it's undisputed that, that the the proponents of the ordinance um, were touting the specific provisions about how the money would be used over the, the term of the tax, correct? Honor, th this court has never gone outside the text of the summary and the amendment to determine what the intent was and what the proponents had argued. So I don't think you should consider at all uh, Mr. White's uh, proposal that ads and mailers are somehow relevant to the analysis. Um, the voters looked at the ballot summary, and yes, you should consider the amendment. Um, and the amendment provides for a, a as Mr. White has uh, conceded, the amendment provides for an ordinance uh, complete in itself by just saying we're going to have a tax for 30 years uh, for transportation purposes. So in that sense, I uh, would submit that it is severable. But also, uh, well, Justice, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just struggle with that. If you're looking at the pers perspective of a lawmaker, if the lawmaker uh, says, "I'm enacting this tax for these specific purposes," and then the lawmaker is told, "Well, um, you, you can't. We aren't going to guarantee you get those specific purposes." 
Well, I think a lawmaker might say, well, I don't want the tax in because the tax is for the specific purposes that were designated. So I'm just, I'm struggling to see how those things aren't just so tied together uh, in the way that this process uh, evolved. And I'm not talking about anything outside the ordinance itself or the, uh, the charter amendment itself. Uh, that it's just, to disentangle that um, would do violence to the will of the voters. I mean, the voters couldn't have a chance to vote on this again um, in, a, in a form that is presented to them that's consistent with the state statute. Um, but to, to say that they're going to get the tax but not uh, 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 necessarily get what was wanted, and I, I'm not at all clear of the way the arguments are made here about what can be changed, what can't be changed. It's suggested, well, the county commission really doesn't have to follow that, but they kind of do. So I'm, I'm, what, what's your position on that? As far as what can be changed? Yes. Um, I think that the uh, county commission can deem appropriate uh, whatever allocations it wants, and I think that the amendment um, recognizes that and I'd like to go through because you were asking about specific language in the amendment so I'd like to go through for you the specific language in the amendment we're relying on and it starts with the very first section 1101 the, it says the proceeds of the surtax shall be distributed and dispersed in compliance with section 2120551 and in accordance with the provisions of article 11 then 1102 which Mr. Ho quoted says the transportation surtax shall be levied and imposed in accordance with section 212054 and section 212051, the rules promulgated by the Department of Revenue and this article well, 11. Let me just stop you there. What, what if the and is completely ineffectual there because the specific directive is itself inconsistent with the statutory directive that it's the county commission that gets to decide? So it, wouldn't it be extraordinarily misleading to say inconsistent with this and this if you cannot guarantee the and, what, everything that comes after the and? No, because if you combine that, Your Honor, with the supremacy clause at the end of the amendment itself, I think the, the gist that you get from the amendment is that uh, whenever there's a conflict between the statute and the amendment, the statute is going to govern. So, so I, I think that, again, if we understand your, your argument, I understand it to be that um, the the directive as to how the money is going to be used is essentially a nullity because because the commission could do something else. Yes, but the commission okay. um, has the will of the voters. Fifty-seven percent of the county voted for this amendment, and the county commission has that as disposal. So and the only check is political accountability, as opposed to le there's no legal check on what the county can do outside of the four broad categories in the statute. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And could you, could, what's your answer to the question of why this, the way this was presented to the voters as essentially a way to kind of constrain the discretion of the county commission, why kind of just fundamentally at the threshold that doesn't violate the statutory structure here as far as what the legislature says is allowed and how it's to be approved? Well, uh, are you going to the House's uh, argument? Again? It's a statute. I mean, it's based on the. It's based on obviously the statute and what. Yeah. You know. Well, I, I think this is a charter county is different from a non-home rule charter county in that uh, in a charter county, in the um, an ordinance or a charter amendment must be can be uh, constitutional if it's not inconsistent with general law, whereas a non-charter county has only the powers granted to it by general law. And there's nothing in the statute that, for example, prohibits independent oversight. It doesn't address independent oversight. And so, much like in Phantom versus Brevard, Phantom of Brevard, where the, uh, the statute provided for regulation of fireworks displays, this court said, well, that does not prohibit an ordinance or charter amendment requiring insurance for fireworks displays because it's not addressed in the statute and therefore it's not inconsistent with the statute. And so the county can do anything it wants, even in the context of an amendment, for example, establishing a tax, it can still establish an oversight committee independently, even without it, 
uh, saying if there's ever a tax, there needs to be an oversight committee because the statute doesn't expressly prohibit that. You've used and all I your also, yeah. there you're seems the to be a trend. You're in the same boat with everybody else. You've used all your time, but you'll still get your two minutes. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. I have a couple of things I'd like to talk about, but it seems to me it might be more important to answer any questions you have at this point in time for me before I talk about those things. So if there's a question, I'll take it first. If not, on... On the deemed appropriate discussion, there, there are two things to keep in mind. One is, and there's this undercurrent with the supremacy clause, that they can go through this and decide which part of it is constitutional and which part's unconstitutional, and they can therefore deem appropriate anything because they're not really bound by everything that's there. And, and I'm sorry, I, I think the power is to determine whether or not something in a county charter is or isn't valid is vested in the circuit court. And that's why I brought it there. That's why Charlotte County brought it there when they had their 3% cap on the ad valorem issue. The, the county commission just can't look at their own charter and say, well, today we're going to follow this part and tomorrow another part. There, there has to be a rule of law here, and it's done by the courts. It's not done by the elected commissioners. And the other thing which is obvious is that the deemed appropriate in the bond validation, which probably wasn't necessary for the bond validation, and the deemed appropriate in the interlocal agreement were all done when, when they were taking the position that every single thing in Article 11 was constitutional. They didn't really have any choice but to pick the one plan because it was the only cheeseburger on the menu at that point in time. So th there's nothing really about the political process there that should override the judicial process in this particular situation. If the, if the county commissioners were able to, when they wanted, deem this to be invalid, what, what would that do for the underwriting of the bond? Well, I'm not a bond lawyer, but it sounds like it would be a bad idea to me. <laughs> <laughs> And, and on my concession that, that, that the summary was about the same as, as the article, what I, I'm trying to point out is that the first, I think it's 48 words, are all about the plan and what the projects they're going to do in various cities and, and neighborhoods in Hillsborough County. The, the overall purpose is both here and in the article telling them that this is what you're going to get if you vote for this. And that's just wrong. So thank you very much. Members of the court, the people of Hillsborough County voted for these badly needed transportation improvements and the state legislature gave them a role. To the question that Justice Munoz asked earlier, the county commission could have put this exact same uh, issue before the people in the terms of a referendum. And the legislature, when it created this statute, gave a role for both parties. They didn't just say that the county commission could do it alone. They said that the people had to approve it. If the county commission were going to the people and asking for them to vote, for a surtax, they would tell them what the tax was going to be spent on. That makes sense. And it makes sense that if the people want to come forward and put on the ballot a surtax, they're going to have to say what the money is going to be spent on. There is no dispute that the uses that are provided in the Charter Amendment are applicable and approved under 212.055. And what the people saw on the ballot summary can be achieved either by upholding the entire Charter Amendment or by doing and upholding what Judge Barbas did. Judge Barbas went in and blue penciled out the allocations, if that gives the court discomfort, and, and uh, blue penciled out portions of the responsibilities of the Independent Oversight Committee. Even with those changes, the purposes that are in the ballot summary, what the people voted on, spending it on the categories of uses which are in the statute and having oversight can still be achieved and the voters' will can be upheld for these badly needed transportation improvement projects. Thank you. First to answer just, Justice Polson's question, the, the bonds are contingent upon validation. That's why we filed the validation proceedings, so no bonds would be issued un, unless and until they're validated. Uh, the only thing I want to point out is, in this case, no funds were distributed uh, under the tax until the county deemed appropriate the allocations and distributions uh, 
in the in Article 11. But but you know, I guess the part of the dynamic here is it seems like that this is this initiative, and I'm you know I'm I'm sympathetic with the the county in this situation. It's like they're presented with kind of an offer you can't refuse. I mean, I don't know how much money's involved here, maybe $9 billion, or I've seen other numbers, but so, I mean, it's a rare group of public servants that would turn down $9 billion. Well, the Your ability Honor, I to spend $9 billion. I mean, I, I mean, we understand that. Um, but the question is, uh, that we're confronted here, is whether really that, that kind of offer you can't refuse, is it really does violence to what the statute the framework that the statute, because this, this, the county, this is only an option because the legislature said so, right? Yes. Uh, there's no inherent power in the county or in the people of the county to do this. This is the, what the legislature um, uh, authorized. And, and, and it, I'm just struggling with seeing how uh, this can be reconciled with that, with the, specific requirements in that framework and the, where, where the authority is allocated by the legislature. If I can address the premise of your argument, which is an offer you can't refuse, <laughs> the county commission could have refused and not deemed appropriate the allocations in Article 11. And in fact, there was a dissenter. It was a six to one vote. It could have been a four to three, three to four vote and say, no, we're going to allocate it the way well, we I, want. I, but that, I, that just, I, I, make my, I, I just yeah. repeat my observation that it's a rare group of uh, public officials who will turn down the ability to spend $9 billion. No, but it also, it also, I mean, the whole argument about popular sovereignty and the people approve this, I mean, it just seems like it's, to say that, you know, that to hang your hat on that, but then to say that because of, because of the statute controls anyway, the county could do whatever it wanted within what the legislature told it to do as opposed to what the people told them to do when they approved it. It just doesn't seem like an argument that, it just, it's just not a plausible way of looking at it. Well, the statute, the, the county can only do what it wants as far as the uses. That's the only requirement in the statute. Um, everything else uh, in Article 11 um, was not inconsistent with the statute, and the, and the county commission couldn't change that. For example, the uh, Independent Oversight Committee. Um, if, but if, the, if the intent was to have the <clears throat> county commission still have discretion on what goes on, this is a strange way of writing this to be voted on by the people. I understand, Your Honor, but the, as I was going through the provisions, it's not just 1101 and 1102, it's also, I believe, 1105, and the actual disbursements in 1107 and 1108, which is the general purpose provision and the tr uh, transit restricted portion, both say, have the caveat, um, as permitted by, and to the extent permitted by, Section 212.055. But though, isn't there, there's even an audit provision to make sure the expenditures are done as allocated and as what has been agreed to. There, there is an audit, audit provision, um, but the audit provision, you're auditing different things depending on what the county commission decides to do. Uh, there's no question they could have said, we don't deem this appropriate. There was a dissenting vote about it. And uh, it wasn't my fault, Your Honor. <laughs> all right, but I, I think uh, all, the, all the time has now expired. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but we thank you for your arguments and for the excellent briefs in this case. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you very much.